All right, and we are live. Welcome back with Murphy Mac to another episode of the Fitness Beginner Podcast. Today we got a special episode for y'all. Today we have an interview with Sifu. He is an author. He is a coach. He is a speaker. But well, I don't want to steal his thunder, so I'm going to let him introduce himself for, for the podcast today. Hey there, Murphy. I'm glad to be here. And uh, you had asked me about the time schedule today. And it's really funny because I've been doing my training and I do the training all year. Don't miss a day. Usually two little trainings per day. I say little hour and a half in the morning, half hour at night, and then maybe a sport in between several days per week. So I'm all trained at age 61 for skiing. And I've been in uh, Colorado in the Frisco Breckenridge area for about 16 days. And I've got some good skiing in. But just when I was really getting to my peak level and I wanted to do a few more days, a uh, blizzard started. So that gave us snow, but the wind stayed. And we have had windstorm for two days with 30 and 50 mile an hour winds. So you asked me about my schedule today. I can't go outside because I'll get blown over. And if I took my gloves off to play with my iPhone and shoot a video, I'd freeze my fingers in about 15 seconds. Well, I'm actually very jealous of you. I've always wanted to get out to Colorado so I could go snowboarding. I've been begging my wife to go, but she's more of a she's more of a beach person. So I want to. I'm trying to convince her to let's go out west, some go to Colorado and go skiing. We'll get out there one day. So you wanted to hear a little bit about my my background. So I've been into fitness since I was six years old. And it's not a bad thing to be into for all of us, but especially someone who's an ectomorph, which means the Michael Jackson build, Gilligan from Gilligan's Island build. So it's the smaller frame person. And I happen to be, Bruce Lee is an ectomorph. And Bruce Lee front to back, his chest to his back is about big. So even though I'm thin, I'm a little bit bigger than, than he is. He's a very petite fellow at five foot seven and maybe 130 pounds at when 135, when he was working too hard and neck at not getting enough sleep, 160s at his highest when he was doing performance enhancing substances. So that's Bruce. But for me wanting to play sports at age 6, 10, 15, and 20, et cetera, with people who were more Schwarzenegger builds and, uh, and behemoth builds like weightlifters, the um, endomorphs and then mesomorph like Schwarzenegger, I had to do fitness in order not just to be functional, but to have some musculature and some stature and some strength in order to be able to run and push and volleyball slams, all the swimming, all these sports that require some musculature. I had to do that. And it's been part of my life to, to maintain Not the Michael Jackson build. I'm a little bit bigger. I'm, I can get up to about 178. Michael Jackson was probably... 150 something 140s if he was really thin so i would be like his build maybe just a little bit taller but with with more beef on me so it was a lot of work to do that yeah we're now hearing you say that we're actually very similar i got into fitness for the same exact reason i was very very small uh, i'm actually about the same size i'm five nine right now and about 175 pounds but i have a lot of I have a pretty good amount of muscle on my on my body, but yeah, same reason. I played sports, grew up playing baseball, football, basketball. I was very active as a child, and I was very skinny. With that being said, so as soon as I got into the gym and started working out, I immediately fell in love with. It. As soon as I saw the progress, me getting stronger and putting on a little size, I was hooked from day one. So I've never looked back since then, and that's kind of my story of how I got into fitness. You're a little bit more tissue per height than I am. I'm almost 6'3", six, 6'2 six, and a half. And right now I'm around 172 because I um, just been doing a lot of work and a lot of fitness and, and not enough downtime and more more naps and, and deeper sleep. So I kind of like a busy mind. So right now the busy mind, mind is not letting me get that completely relaxed state uh, for naps and for sleep, which is the time that I can get up and put on an extra eight or 10 pounds. Yeah, I lack in the sleep sleep department myself. <laughs> so Sifu, you are known for being a wellness coach. So with wellness today, it's come, it's becoming more and more important, especially with the, the foods that we have available to us. I always like to say that food is fuel that provides energy for our body. So in a sense, you need food in order to survive. But with the way society is nowadays, we've kind of morphed that the purpose of food into eating for pleasure instead of eating for survival. So I know that 
you're big on reading the the light food labels. So what's kind of some things that when you're looking at a nutrition label, what are some things that you look for? Like it's a red flag that when you see it, you're like, nope, not eating that. Like it's a no go. I'm not going to go there. The hard part for me, Murphy, and most people in the, the last 20 to 30 years, when I was a kid, if we wanted to put sugar or honey on our cereal, just an oatmeal, cream of wheat, all these breakfast things, we would do that. In my grand, grandparents' time, there was very little sugar that came in a packaged food. And in my mother's generation, very little difference between the 30 years from when, when her mom was a, a kid. And starting in the 1980s, I would say, in the late 70s and early 80s, they just kept ramping up the amount of sugar and they used corn syrup, unfortunately. It was discovered in the 50s and then it was uh, instituted industrial food, uh, just permeated that, that industrial food industry starting in the 70s. So corn syrup was in everything. It was in chips, in cereal, a lot of the liquid foods that we had, uh, sodas, just pervaded. And then when corn syrup got a bad rap over the last 15 to 20 years, they started doing a lot with cane sugar. So when I go to Trader Joe's, which is one of my normal markets, if there's a Trader Joe's in the area, and we have them in Santa Barbara, where I've been living, we've got three. It's one of the reasons, amazingly enough, in 2004, I moved there because we have three Trader Joe's. And inside of the uh, extended 15 miles, we'll have a Trader Joe's. And the problem is there's almost, I think, one cereal left at Trader Joe's that doesn't have cane sugar in it. So it's really hard in the modern era to find food with low chemicals because you, you can see on your label, instead of having five ingredients, eight ingredients, you'll sometimes have 10 to 15 ingredients, all these chemicals that allow for shelf life, taste, slow down, uh, all, all these types of things, which is shelf life, just all this, this chemicalized stuff. And then texture, There's, there are chemicals that are there for the texture of the food. And they want to make everything uniform because the buyer in their busy life, they walk in there and they pour that in there and they go, this is different. And different to some people might mean bad. And so it's the same thing with the apples. When I was growing up, apples could have a mark on it like they normally do in a, in a normal orchard. But in the, in the modern era, they have to have the buyers for these big supermarkets. They want to have everything uniform. So there are no marks. There's no uh, things that look like a deformity because the buyer in their conscious and unconscious mind, they get pet re reticent about purchasing things that aren't perfect. So those are some some problems we face and some of the insanity that we that we face in terms of our choices and our purchasing habits with food, whether it's processed or it's actually a vegetable or a fruit that's off of a tree or a plant. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned Trader Joe's. So down here in Alabama, we don't have Trader Joe's, or at least not in the in Mobile where I'm at. But we went on my anniversary trip, we went to Arizona, and they had a Trader Joe's there. And my wife was adamant about going to Trader Joe's. She was like, we have to go there. Because she sees it on TikTok all the time. She's like, we have to go to Trader Joe's. So while we were there, we made sure we went to Trader Joe's and she fell in love with it immediately. She had to buy all kinds of stuff while we was in there. <laughs> she loved it. So she's yeah, a she beach, she's a beach a beach person, so she'll like my virtual background. <laughs> oh yeah, she loves it. We we live pretty close to the beach, so she loves it. What's um, the weather uh, right now? Is it in the fifties high or what would you say? Uh, it actually got colder just last night and it's it's like the forties, fifties today. So that's about as cold as it's gonna get this year. It don't get it don't get that much colder here. Like, literally yesterday I was wearing shorts and a t shirt. Wow. I had to wear yesterday. I, I, I drove my car to the transit center here in Frisco, Colorado, about an hour and 40 minutes west of Denver, near near Vail, about 25 minutes east of Vail. And I had two pairs of tights, like uh, rash guard tights, a pair of sweatpants, all that was cotton. The other two weren't cotton. And then I had my ski pants over that. So there was four pairs of pants and then bundled up with a, a a down liner jacket and then my big down jacket like people used to go up Mount Everest. And I have all this done, the hood, the hats, the goggles, and I get to the, the bus stop and the winds just kept kicking up and up. At 8.30 in the morning was the first bus. I'm 
got my heat going on in my car. I've got a heated car seat on the rental car and I'm reading a book and I'm saying, is this one going to die down? The weather report said no. So I'm, then the next bus an hour later comes by and I, I wanted to ski, but I said, it's not smart to go skiing where people can't even see because the wind's kicking up the snow. It was snowing. And so somebody could not see me or I could not see them. Or it's just so uncomfortable that I'm not going to be moving the way I would normally move. And if you're going at 20 to 30 miles an hour, uh, you're, you're asking for trouble, in my opinion, if you go out there with the 25, 30 mile an hour wind, winds with snow coming down. Yeah, especially as an amateur like I am, I definitely wouldn't be going out there. <laughs> I've only been snowboarding one time in my life, so I wouldn't ch take a chance either. All right. So we hit on the nu nutrition labels. Go back to that topic. What I like to think is the general rule of thumb is when you're shopping at a grocery store to stay around like outside of the grocery store. Because if you think about it, you have most time you walk into a grocery store, you have your meats are on the outside and then you have all your fruits and vegetables are going to be around the outside. I say stay away from the aisles in the grocery store. Yeah. So like yeah. aisles in the middle are normally where your junk food is, your processed food, all that kind of stuff. I mean, not everything in there, but most for the most part, if you stay out of those aisles and you shop around the edge of the grocery store, that's a good general rule of thumb of those are probably the foods that you should be eating. So that's like I, I agree with you. The, the processed food, there, I'm looking up at the counter here. Um, I'm in a studio uh, Airbnb right now, and I'm looking up at my boxed food, which is very limited. I don't buy much boxed food, but crackers, and if they're the best crackers with the least amount of chemicals in them, those are doable and they're easily used for things like snacks, which I, I, I wouldn't call a snack. It's a meal. I really don't eat snacks. I have three meals a day. That's enough food. So the crackers with some almond butter, hopefully in a, in a glass jar, uh, it's just pure almonds that have been crushed. So there is oil in there and you just mix it up. So the, that and crackers is a great meal while you're taking a break from skiing. So if I start skiing at 830, at 11, I can have the crackers with the high fat content almond butter. And uh, that's a great snack to provide calories and energy for that person who's been burning them on the cold ski slope. So that's limited on the box food. Oatmeal comes in a carton that looks made out of similar material. So I'd have some of that steel cut oats and then Kashi cereal with the least amount, no amount of sugar if you can. I do use honey. I'm a believer in honey. It's hard for me to eat cereal or oatmeal without <clears throat> some form of a sweetener. So honey is my, my go-to sweetener. And there are some good properties of honey. You certainly don't want to overdo it. And you certainly don't want to leave it on your, your, in your oral hygiene area. You want to get that out of there by rinsing your mouth out after every meal, no matter what you eat. Just do 20 to 30 seconds. Even more is better. Just rinsing out with water really good job on that and then just swallow it <clears throat> and then there there you are so those are some uh things on the on the box food and celery i would say that celery and the fiber is probably one of the number one things that we all need for our microbiome for our digestion to provide that prebiotic so that when we, when we eat yogurt and we eat kimchi and we eat uh, drink kombucha that we have a place for those probiotics to live, they live off of that fiber, things like celery, onions, etc. So if you do that, you've got the gut health. And then the other thing fiber does is it slows down the digestion. So that if people are food cravers, I'm listening to the banging going on because the winds just kicked up to 40 or 50 miles an hour and they're banging some kind of a metal structure outside. It might be a dumpster, but something's like clanging. <laughs> so we're in a storm, even though I've got this uh, sea virtual background behind me, the ocean virtual background. But So those are some things. So all of us need fiber, and especially people who have a problem with weight weight gaining, more fiber is, is better for, for many of those people. You've got to test these things to see if they work, but you don't want things passing through the not being digested properly. The fiber slows it down and it also gives us the, the sated, satiated feeling so that when that's slow, we're not in between meals like a lot of people do. 
shooting out to a 7-Eleven or some sort of a convenience thing and getting more food, which is often junk food. So those are some some quick tips mm-hmm. for the audience, Murphy. You mentioned washing your mouth out after eating some kind of honey. So I'm not familiar. What exactly, why would you do that? What's the reasoning behind that? So <clears throat> what you want to do is not have food particles in your mouth the first thing like fiber can get stuck in between your teeth if you have space in between your teeth. And I'm guessing that 90% of the people of the world have space between their teeth that things can stay in. There is a percentage of people who have really good dentition and they don't have room and they don't, they don't floss because nothing can get in there. They've got big thick gums coming up and their teeth are properly positioned. But for the rest of us, you don't want any food goes in between your teeth and you don't want the coating of liquids like sh- sugary, honey, carbohydrates hanging out in there, giving the, f- the bacteria in our mouth, which has a job. You don't want to eliminate all bacteria, but you want to have the bacteria at a healthy level so it's doing what it's supposed to do, which is eating some of the food particles. But you don't want to give it enough of your own calories and food so that they multiply. You don't want all of the bacteria that you have multiplying by 10 times or five times or whatever the number is when they're hanging out, when you're drinking drinks, sugary sodas during the day. So if you're a non-sugary drink drinker and you're just eating meals and drinking water or tea during the day, then just after the meal's over, wash your mouth out by really swishing around good at least 20 seconds is is what i would recommend and more is better to get that, those particles out of your mouth that's pretty interesting i never really thought about it that way but it makes a lot of sense i may have to start doing that i guess i ain't gonna lie don't do that right now. do that and do your kegel exercise every time to you go to the restroom and if you do those two things you'll be ahead of 99 percent of the people in the world that don't do those two things I bet that's good for your, your teeth, too. Your dentist will be happy that you're doing that. Um, I agree. So you mentioned honey is your choice of sweetener. So how do you feel about artificial sweeteners? Are they good? Are they bad? Disaster. Does that, anything that's chemicalized, Jacqueline, I don't, do you know who Jacqueline is? Uh, I don't think so. He is America's fitness pioneer from the 1930s until, until he passed on in 2011 at 96. So... He uh, set all kinds of records in fitness, uh, opened the first gym, and I think it was in Berkeley, California, and he was a fitness phenom, and he looked like a smaller bodybuilder, and he did it almost all with bodyweight exercises. He did some weight training, but most of his exercises were swimming and, and body build, uh, sorry, bodyweight exercises, and he had the longest running TV show on fitness and, and diet and the longest running one man radio show on on fitness and diet so you might check out some of his content that's still on youtube jack la lane from american guy from uh, berkeley california originally so are you familiar with stevia because they say stevia is natural artificial sweeteners so but i should have said sorry to interrupt murphy i should have said chemicalized artificial sweeteners i have a problem with so like Um, sucralose and i love it i think uh what's the other one I can't think of them right now, but most of these, most of these uh, chemicals that are made in a designed in a laboratory and then in industrial manufacturing happens, and the non-natural ones are they've done tests on them for the last fifty years, and the tests that are done by independent people, not by industries in that field, uh, have almost invariably found side effects, many times substantial side effects. I can't think of the one that's in dog food that was ushered in in the 1980s, but it creates intestinal problems where their intestines actually get blocked and twist up. And that's still being used to this day. It was passed. Our former minister of defense, I can't think of his name. He was paid $1 million when $1 million was a lot of money back in the 80s to allow that aspartame was permitted to be a uh, used as a sweetener and it's a really toxic substance that has all kinds of problems so if you see anything with aspartame do not use 
Yeah, I try, I've been trying to stay away from the chemical artificial sweeteners, <clears throat> but I do like to use the stevia because it's supposed to be better for you because it comes from a plant or whatever. Yeah. So I will use that. And it's, yeah. um, so that in Mobile, we're pretty, probably like 20 minutes or so from my house. The only sucralose plant like in the United States is, is here in Mobile. That's where they actually make Splenda. They actually make it pretty close to my house. Um, there, are, there are some um, really good aligned with people who know a lot and also have good intuition and are very empathetic, caring people. Some of them are naturopaths. Some of them are research scientists who had to leave the industrial side and the propaganda side and went into the independent side where they, they could actually tell what they really thought about some, uh, some of the, the knowledge that they have and the, and the studies. And the studies are out there, but I would guess something in, in the order of 85 to 90 percent of the studies are funded by the industry themselves to make a, like a marketing thing and to alleviate fall fallout in, the, in their marketing. So you have to find studies that aren't part of that matrix. And then you have to find experts who who, who get the meta analysis, which is research on the research. So they they look at 10 or 50 studies and then they look at the uh, the results of studies and then they use that information until something refutes it. And that's how science works. But that's what I would say about stevia. I haven't used it recently. I have taken it uh, before, but honey to me is so easy and so inexpensive and it lasts a long time. Like, a, a, I don't know, I can't read the ounces on my honey, but I think it's eight ounces. I could probably get out of that maybe a month to five weeks. So it, to me, that's a pretty good value for six dollars, uh, you know, cost. So your honey, do you only use like the raw honey? Nothing, nothing else. That's what I look for. And, and, yeah. and more and more, they're going into plastic containers. It's unfortunate, mm -hmm. but if you know, if I druthers, as they say, I would, I would have raw honey local if I could and in glass jars. Yeah. My grandfather's a big honey guy and he loves local honey. So he has a hookup of a guy that he knows that makes his own honey here in Mobile. So I actually have a big old jar of it in my cabinet now in a, in a glass jar. So my wife's a big honey person. She, she puts it on pretty much everything. I should um, qualify my statement. The $6 was plastic container, Trader Joe's honey, not local. So if, if I want local glass container, I might have to spend at least twice that much, maybe three or four times that much. And I wouldn't feel bad because I want the local farmer to thrive, not just survive, but I want the local farmer to, to thrive there, um, ever in, in, in their lifestyle. And it's also, the local honey is also better for you because they say it, it helps with the, uh, the pollen and things like that with the, with that local, the air. And I forget what the word is. Um, you, you're, it helps the, the local cheese and things like that. It's good yeah. for you. You mean our internal use or the, or that the, the bees doing things in the, in the area, which one are you talking about? For, well, I don't know. This is just what I've heard for our internal use. Like I feel like it's better to use bees in your local areas, honey. Cause it's, cause they get all the, I can't remember the word I'm looking for, but yeah, it's better than getting it from somewhere else. They, they get all the pollen from the, the local plants and, mm -hmm. and then we're uh, to those allergens, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not, that makes sense. That's what I'm trying to say. All right. So with today's day and age, obviously there's an obesity epidemic and people have very bad food addictions. So when it comes to your overall like food nutrition philosophy, what would you say? How would you say you lean? Do you, should we go vegetarian? Do you eat meat? Should we eat raw meat? A lot of people say you shouldn't eat red meat. So what's kind of like your philosophy around nutrition altogether is from coming from being like a hunter gatherer to the way we are now. So there, there was a debate um, in the community and vegans would, would fall into that community probably, perhaps. And I've gone when I lived on Oahu and Hon Honolulu, I went to, uh, I think it was a monthly meeting of the vegetarian society. And and I had conversations, I wouldn't call them debates, but I listened to the people there and I didn't agree with much of what they said. And I think, I think that they talk about it, but it's better for the planet, I would agree with. Uh, for some people, vegetarian and vegan is better for, I agree with that. But, but the part that they say 
it's better for everyone to do that. I disagree with wholeheartedly. Ayurvedic medicine from India is the oldest running, well-known form of medicine and lifestyle on the planet. So the Ayurvedic practitioners who are in vogue right now, because people are finding that Western medicine, industrialized medicine, solving symptoms and doing invasive surgery and watching uh, people eat poor food. None of that's really working. Uh, it fixes broken bones very well. Uh, when you have an accident, it can infections, it can do all those invasive things very well, but it doesn't do very good on wellness. Whereas integrative medicine, naturopathy, naturopaths, and Ayurvedic medicine do much better on wellness promotion and lifestyle. So Ayurvedic medicine to me is comes in over the top. And then down here you have vegetarian, you have omnivore, you have all these other things, yoga, all, all these great parts of the, the wellness and, and lifestyle program. But <clears throat> what I would say is for people who don't know what might work for them and, and their diet, and they haven't figured it out by their own testing, you go to an Ayurvedic practitioner, you can do that online, you can do it by phone call, you can do it in person if there's one in your area, and you find out what your dosha is, which, which means vata, pitta, and kapha. And so people like me are normally vata with something else mixed in. I, um, high energy, we have more brain fog if we if like a standard American diet, the SAD diet, I, so I eat a different diet. Meat is part of that diet for people that are that are in kapha pithas like I am, predominantly vata. And uh, we need rest. We want to eat non-dry food. We want to eat wet food. So my oatmeal and soups, he wants me to eat more broth. He wants me to avoid eating like dry celery, dry carrots, dry fruit. Um, he wants to put them in stew so that they're moist and they're they're in a broth type thing and eat it that way. So those are some of the things that I think people should start with. And if you don't believe me, that's fine. You, you have been opposed to Ayurvedic medicine, but I'll bet you somebody in your group of 20 contacts has. Watch some videos online and then try it. And if it, if it for you, great. I have not heard anyone tell me, and I've been at this wellness game for decades, that Ayurvedic medicine and having a good therapist, a doctor, from Ayurvedic medicine, analyze them and help them with their diet, their sleep, their activities, their health, it, that it has good solutions and, and pro proper evolution like a, for them. So I would, I would with those types of things before I worried about saving the planet, because if you're a mess, you're not going to even want to be on this planet. So that, that's what I start with. Yeah, I'm a huge proponent of do what works for you. Don't try to do what somebody else does because everybody's different. Like your yeah. diet is not going to work for somebody else. My workout routine is not going to work for everybody. Uh, people will feel like they see these influencer things online, which I think is great. I love it. That's kind of what I do. But people try to copy what other people do, and it just don't work. It don't always work for other people. So you have to, I say, try it both ways or try three different ways, four different ways, however you want to do it. And then whatever works best for you, whatever you can stick to, like that's what you should do when it comes to anything in life, not just your diet, your workout plan, your career, anything like that. It goes, you try it multiple ways, get your get back from it and do what you can actually stick to. Yeah, so for, for people who wanna contact us, I'll share my info and then you can share yours and then we'll see if we can help people out there online, usually, or even on a phone call, but if they're in our area, we could do it in person. So they just go to Sifu Slim, S-I-F-U Slim.com or theagingathlete.com and they can book a session with me and there are a variety of options. And I do fitness, wellness, and life coaching. So if we're at a gym or we're at a park and we're doing exercises, I'm not the type of person who goes, and one, and two, and three, kind of like the 70s. Mm. I'm not that guy. I'm gonna show you the exercise, but you're gonna to start to get that feeling and you're gonna be watching you. And you will do a lot of nonverbal communication. Like you'll see me nodding and you'll see me going, you know, like this way. And so I don't need this to speak about that. But while we're doing uh, something like a hip flexor medley, where there's maybe eight minutes of exercises based around the, the hips and mobility and uh, stretching and you know, doing stretching, I'll have time to talk to them. So there's the life coaching that can filter in. 
so that I'll say, hey, what about this? And, and they'll say, well, this is what I'm doing there, but I have a problem with this. So we'll talk about that job, family, problems with their son, whatever it is. We can do all that stuff while we're uh, while we're fitness because that gives us, you know, wealth in life gives us three things in our 50 minutes or an hour and a half. So that that accomplishes a lot. So they don't have to go out and seek that elsewhere and pay for that elsewhere. They can get it all under in their one session. Speaking of your coaching, I want to hit on the books you've wrote. So if you don't know, he is Sifu is an author. He's wrote well two books. You may have written more. I'm not sure. But the two that, three, okay. But the two main ones is The Sedentary Nation and The Aging Athlete. So, yeah, book, book number three is called Raising a Child Athlete. Okay. Things you need to know, and I haven't released that yet because I'm waiting for a marketing campaign to, to fit in place before I release that. Okay. So I want to ask you a little bit about The Aging Athlete. So when you say an aging athlete, who exactly is this book for? So like, is an aging athlete somebody that, just got out of high school or college that played sports that's getting older or somebody that's in their forties, older in life. Like what's, what's the for? Murphy, that's, that's an interesting question because in the marketing angle, you want to always promote the positive. At least that's what a lot of people do. But when I read fast food nation and that was written, I think in 2003, and a best-selling book about the history of fast foods and how we handle our, our diet. It's a very thick book, very dense, a lot of great information, very well written. And that was not a positive topic, and it did really well. So I wrote Sedentary Nation, and it's a history of physical movement from the hunter-gatherers to the desk couch and car potatoes. And it talks about the end of movement and the co convenience and how we can live more like our ancestors who were the farmers and the uh, hunting and gathering people before them. So I did that. And while I was writing that book, a doctor who's an orthopedic surgeon who, who replaces parts on regular people and on athletes, he said, for your next book, write one called The Aging Athlete, because it's a new field in orthopedic medicine. So I started looking into that. And while I was in my initial stages of thinking about the aging athlete, I met a an NFL who was now in his 60s up in Northern California at a gym. And he was 260 pounds, six foot four, and might have even been six five, big lineman from the 60s and 70s. And he looked really good. I said, How do you stay in shape? And he said, I create in the gym. I've never heard anybody say that then or before then or since then. I recreate in the gym five days a week. And I play doubles tennis twice a week. And I said, wow, that sounds like a great program. I said, all right, how many people in your generation, the 60s and 70s of your NFL brothers that were playing with you, how many of those people are still fit? He said, less than 10%. I said, how many of those people are still practicing daily physical activity? He said, less than 10%. So I've been on a quest to find out more about that. And that started in... 2009 and i'm up to 2310 athletes interviewed and invariably it's the same statistic 90 percent become sedentary starting the week after they leave high school college or pro sports or the military or broadway dancing or a retired postal person or a retired general contractor it's the same in every case 90 percent don't do regular physical activity 10% do, and I'm trying to, to bring the number up. And you ask me about aging. We age every day and we age every year. So it's for everyone who's aging. Yeah, that's great. That's kind of behind the, the content create in the podcast itself is I want to increase that number. I want more people to participate in physical activities. It don't have to be fitness, working out in the gym. That's what I like to do. It could be running, walking, just getting outside, playing with your kids, just increase people's physical levels in any way, shape, form, or fashion. That's kind of the whole point of, of my, that's like my mission on for making my content. What's the biggest excuse you hear, Murphy? Don't have time. <clears throat> don't know what to do. Well, guess what? If you don't know what to do, there's thousands of hours of content online telling you exactly what to do. You can watch, listen to my podcast. You can listen to Seafood's podcast. 
or go to YouTube and type in any question you need. The information is there. You just have to be willing to actually do it and you have to have the time to do it. But most people, when it comes to the time thing, my philosophy is you'll never have time ever. Nobody ever has time. Everybody's schedule is full. We all have these things that we want to do, things that we need to do. So what you have to do is you have to make the time. You have to literally schedule it out and make time. You have to sacrifice something else that you want to do that's not necessarily a necessity. You have to sacrifice that and make time for working on your health, for your physical fitness. I agree. So when it comes to your sed sedentary nation um, book, what inspired you to write this book? Did you did from any sedentary issues yourself? I asked this question because my my full my is I work at a desk all day. So I sit down for eight to 10 hours a day and I'm very sedentary and it drives me nuts, but I don't want to like suffer from some issues. I've already seen like my hips are real tight from sitting down all day. I'm already kind of experiencing the issues. So what kind of inspired you to, to write this, this book? When you're, you're an author and you're looking at the history, you're looking at sociology and psychology, of what's happening in your generation. My generation, I was born in 62, so I'm 61 right now. I saw the very drastic difference from my first 20 years, 62 to 82. And from, from then on that my friends and also their parents, the people I work with, they became desk, couch, and car potatoes in that time. In the 60s and 70s, you had a lot of people who were on softball games, tennis, golf, walking, hiking, running. The running craze started in the 70s. So there was just a lot of physical activity. We became industrial food consumers. We became high sugar, big drinks. You know, sodas just kept getting bigger and bigger. The big gulp drinks, I think at 7-Eleven. So we just more calories going in, less movement, more psychological problems, more diabetes, more obesity, more uh, uh, extreme obesity, uh, morbid obesity, this thing, and then dysfunctional. So people needed massage therapy, chiropractics much more, physical therapy, taking pills, taking pills, uh, psychotropic drugs, it's, and, and more drug addicts. So people wanting to feel better got addicted and they just kept doing uh, harmful drugs. So these are the types of things that I, I saw my first 40 years. And it was so hurtful for me to, I'm a very empathetic, caring person. When I saw that, it hurt me. And so I wanted to look into the history. So Sedentary Nation is a book that looks into the history of physical movement and, and also for tips, like a wellness guide mixed in. And I haven't seen any other book kind of do it. I've done it. So I hope people like it for its message. And I hope people like it for its, re its readability and its intellectual stimulation. And, I, and if you read a chapter a week, I think I will help you. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think um, with social being such a big thing nowadays, I think people are finally starting to realize that they they need to be more active. Like They're starting to see that being so sedentary is really hurting our, our health long term. So I think people are finally starting to catch on. Like, okay, maybe start this working out thing or this running thing, eating healthier. Um, so yeah, I think in the next few years we'll see – people's health start to get better as a whole. I hope so, at least. That's that's what I hope. Um, I don't know. I start the gyms nowadays, I feel like are, they're pretty full. Like a lot of people are in the local gyms around here. So I feel like it's, it's becoming more of a thing to work on your health. I feel like for a while there, people kind of quit working on it. But I think they're starting to realize, hey, fitness can solve like 90% of your problems. Instead of going to the doctor and getting a prescription to fix one of your problems, if you would just go to the gym, work out, be healthy, eat a better diet, that problem would more than likely solve itself. Like most, I feel like 90% of things can probably be solved just from working on your health daily instead of just trying to get a, a cheat code, which is a subscription from your, I mean, a, a doctor to kind of, to, I think you're just, when you get a prescription, you're just covering up the problem temporarily. You're not actually fixing the problem. You're just covering it up. So if you would just start working on your health before, you would never have to cover up that problem in the first place. I, I know who's a, a therapist goes and takes care of seniors. And she told me that she can always tell she, you know, blood pressure on 90 year old people at their homes. And 
you know, checking medication, checking on their health. Many people are in bedridden, which is called sedentism. Um, you know, if you can tell when the massage therapist has been there before her. So the massage therapist relieves tension, provides that human dynamic connection, caring, uh, love, therapeutic, that stuff. And so the blood pressure readings, just because of that 50 minute massage and maybe some limp massage, uh, the person testing the blood pressure can tell that that therapist has been there for the massage. So it just shows you how we take care of ourselves. All of our vital signs improve. Oh, for sure. Definitely. So what do you suggest with desk jobs are becoming more and more of a thing and they're going to keep increasing, I believe. So what are some things you would suggest people do to kind of counteract of becoming sedentary? So for example, I have one of those riser desks that stands up and down at work and I love it. Like I'll stand for several hours during the day. I'll, I'll go stand into sitting several times throughout the day just to kind of try to those problems that occur from being sedentary. So do you have any, th any like hacks or tips, like kind of like you would suggest for people to use? So I am a big believer in what you mentioned, desks where you can change position. It's very convenient. I travel a lot. So right now I've got two laptops. One is on a container that stores my ski apparel. And that's for, you know, if I look over and look up a, a fact while you and I were online, but I haven't had to do that. So I've got one over my right. And then the computer that I'm speaking to now the, with the X camera, I've got it on a box. The box cost me nothing. I got it at a, sub, uh, a health food store yesterday because a lot of the they, these health stores, they're very environmentally conscious. So they want people not to be using uh, disposable bags if they didn't bring their own bags. So they provide boxes. They instead of crunching them down to flat and putting them in the dumpster for some other form of recycling, which takes energy to do, they just put these boxes out there and people put their groceries and their supplements in this uh, box. So I'm using that to put my laptop on, on the kitchen counter so it gets the, the camera to a proper height. So you can make a place where you, and I'm standing, of course, so you can make right in your home with your with the, that you currently have, with a table, with a card table, with a counter, you can get your laptop up to the height that you need so that you can stand. And then if you don't want to stand for the, the entire day, you can have a, a, a has the ability to, to go up and down. And you know, I have a really good stool where you have the foot pedal where you can go up and down and, it, and with hydraulics without any electricity, you can you can one of those and you have a place to rest your foot. So go from standing to the stool to taking your um, computer over the couch or an easy chair, sitting in that for a while. Some people use the physio balls. Yeah, I believe in being on a physio ball all day. I don't think that's a good position, but those are four rotations that you could do if you really wanted to do it. And right now I've got my one leg, my right leg up on the chair with bare feet and I'm kind of doing position change. And then I'm going to go down and have two feet on the ground and do it th that way. And then I'll put my left knee up on this soft stool. So just constantly moving is a good thing. And I, and that's, what you, you have to do, if you if you like an airplane or a long car trip, you know how you feel during that trip. And when you get out of the car or airplane after that trip, it's not a good feeling. And that's what a lot of people are doing with their desks by by being st stuck us all day. Yeah. And you mentioned physio ball, a girl that I work with in my office, she actually has one of those and she likes to sit on it. Another thing I've seen on the rise lately is those walking treadmills. So like they're pretty treadmills that people will put at their desk and they'll literally just walk as they're working, which I think that's great. I actually have been yeah. looking into getting one myself, but I haven't got one yet, yeah. but I probably will get one soon. I, that way I just get some extra steps in, change up my sitting position just to do something different. What I do now is to walk is every like hour or two or so, I'll literally just walk around my office or go out in the parking lot and walk a little bit, just not for long, just a couple minutes, just to get my body moving a little bit. So I'm not sitting down all day while I'm at work. Yeah, I, I think those things work well. Some of the companies and um, universities, they have meetings um, where they're in a, a treadmill set up with their laptop or iPad or something in, in front of them on a little shelf on that treadmill. I think all that stuff's wonderful. Some people 
I think some of the people in the Washington, D.C. government, state and county governments, they have meetings galore. They have so much work that they have to do. And, you know, we all people like this, a doctor and a barber and a hair salon person, they're not sedentary. They're walking around, moving a lot. So that that's a better way to go through a busy day. But if you're in meetings and you're sitting constantly, you're looking down at your laptop with that head forward posture, which throws off your whole kinetic chain and your spine health and everything else, bad, it's a bad situation. So if you can do what you mentioned, being on a treadmill, standing up, like meet with my boxes, but imagine they had like a, a, an attractive box, like the stuff that we use for, uh, is it clock jumping? What is that exercise? Mm, room? Box jumps, yeah. Box jumps up there. Something that's an attractive thing where people write on a long conference table that you can put your laptop on. Then it's all of a sudden it's corporate attractive, corporate it gives people a way to keep their head posture up and comfortable. Their shoulders can rest down and they can use their laptop with those 90 degree angles that work well for biomechanics. All those things are wonderful, but it, I think it's a big mistake that what happens in a lot of these companies is they say, oh, once you're disabled, once you're supposed to go get surgery, or once you've already gotten surgery for your spine or your neck, now we're going to give you this $5,000 desk and we're going to give you physical therapy. It's like your, your house that's burned down. You're saying, oh, now we're going to clean out. You know, the, we're going to rebuild the house. Come on. It doesn't work that way. Just, you got to have things that work from the time that you're, you start a company, whether you're a 20 year old worker or a 60 or 80 year old worker, you got to have a, a, a place to proper with it with proper uh, biomechanics and ergonomics so that you can function. Otherwise you're going to break down. I agree. So I want to respect your time. Um, so I have one more question. This is really for, for the listeners. If you, if you want a piece of advice to improve people's wellness, since you're a wellness coach, what would that one piece of advice be? Have a daily practice of fitness, wellness, grounding, relaxation, all in one shot. And do that whether you can only do it for 10 minutes or you can do an hour and a half every morning. Very few people can do an evening program after a long day at work or taking care of their family or sitting on a couch, whatever your day is. So do that in the morning, every morning, whatever schedule you can do and get up early and take a nap if you can and go to sleep within two or three hours after dinner. Having a daily program that does that is a, is a way to go. And if you do that for two weeks, you can put that into your lifestyle and it will have incredible benefits for your happiness, your health, and your wellness. Yeah, I'm a huge, you mentioned doing it in the morning. I'm a huge believer of working out in the morning. That's when I work out every day before work and the more I actually worked out before we're doing this podcast now. <laughs> so I'm a huge person believer in doing it in the morning because there's so many things that happen in our days that could change our schedule that you may miss your workout. You may be planning to go that afternoon, something changes and you can't go. But if you already knocked it out that morning, there's nothing else that can happen in your day to change the fact that you've already worked out. You've already worked on your body, not just physically, but mentally, spiritually as well. So I think doing it in the morning is huge. I always preach that if you can go in the morning, I know you have to wake up earlier and it's not the your favorite thing to do, but you get used to it after a while. Once you get a set routine, set, get used to waking up in the morning and it just becomes part of your everyday routine. I agree. Should we, should we one more round of our websites in case people want to contact us? Oh yeah, of course. Before we do that, do you have any questions that you want to ask me or say to the listeners or anything? Yeah. The question is, do you want to be well? Do you want to be happy? Those are the two big questions. And in a famous movie, oh, the, the Untouchables with Sean Connery and Kevin Costner. Sean Connery said Kevin Costner was playing Elliot Ness and during Prohibition in the 1930s. He says, what are you prepared to do? In a Scottish accent to uh, Elliot Ness. Mr. Ness, what are you prepared to do? And that's really the harsh message for us. What are you prepared to do? And in the military, you don't have a choice. So I have a little bit of that inner Marine in me. I haven't been in the military forces, but I treat myself like I'm my own personal drill sergeant. And I, and I push myself into that activity and I do it and I, and I'm my body. So I'm not pushing myself to hurt myself, but I'm pushing myself to do something that I don't always want to do. So if I do that, 
I am prepared, I'm ready, I'm focused, and I do that thing, which may be hard at times, but once it's over, it, as you know, our physiology, our, our muscles, tendons, our ligaments, all of our tissue, if you do a hard workout, you know that the recuperation, like thighs, can take five days to do their complete healing and, and be ready for another round of the heavy thigh workout. But if you just do some maintenance fitness like I do, which is still hard, I can feel that benefit for two days. But I do something tomorrow that's a little bit different. So I let those thighs recuperate a little bit. But I can feel that benefit. And your, and your mind knows that you did that because the cells are telling your, your neurology that it did that. So it's a, it's, it's like a drug without having to take any drugs. It's a, well, a drug of wellness. Yeah, you mentioned you, you had to force yourself to do it. Um, so I'm a big, I like to believe in the, the five minute rule. So when you don't want to do something, please tell yourself to do it for five minutes. That's it. Yeah. Say you want to work out, Hey, work out, go to the gym five minutes and then you can leave. Well, the way this philosophy, I guess it is works. Once you start that thing that you didn't want to do and you just did it for five minutes, normally you'll realize that it's not that bad or you actually can, can do it or you may enjoy it. So once you do that five minutes, you more than likely will continue to do it longer. So I like the that five minute rule. It's just a good, it's an easy way to get you to do something that you don't want to do. Tell yourself five minutes. Hey, and if you do decide to quit at that five minutes, then that's okay. Hey, at least you gave it a shot. You did it for five minutes. It's better than zero minutes. So you, like, you've got kids, right? Hack. No, I don't have kids. No kids. Okay. Well, let's no. say working with a neighbor's kid and you, you got some leaves to rake and you did the front yard today and now you want to do the backyard tomorrow, but the kids over there, he's addicted to their video game or their television or whatever they're doing. And their, their dad says, yeah, take, take and have them work on the leaves with you and you know, work with that guy. You're kind of like the neighbor uncle to this young lad, which is a good thing. So you got to get them. I don't know how you get them off the video game, but you say, Hey, a video game is different than television because television is not perpetual, but the video game, you can always go back in and log in and say, Hey, Roscoe, why don't we go do these leaves? I've got a couple of things I wanted to ask you. And uh, maybe you have things that we can talk about. Why don't we just go do this? We'll knock it out, get it done in 50 minutes as a team. Otherwise, it's going to take me almost two hours to do this. And it's not going to be fun. But if you're there, Roscoe, it's going to be fun. Uh, I don't want to go. Yeah, in the negative, you say, just, just give it a shot for five minutes. and Let's see how it goes. Ah. And then his dad goes over and shuts down the video game, does the hard thing for you. And Roscoe's, oh, wow. And he comes out with you and you give him the rake and you say, I'm going to give you the best rake because I know you're a really good leaf guy. And here's the gloves to protect you. Once you start going in that movement and you have a little fun you, and you're a little addition of the raking and you high five here and there and you tell a funny joke or a funny story and he starts getting into it. He's completely forgotten that video game, I hope, within the first three to five minutes. So that's what getting, like you said, getting to the gym, getting to the site of fitness. For me, it's I do a lot of outdoor activities on bars, dips, chin-ups, uh, other activities, bars, and, you know, Spider-Man ups that are non-moving Spider-Man push-ups with my feet up on something. So I'm doing a decline Spider-Man push-up, all these things. I'm outdoors. And it's like my own little time to be this martial artsy, calisthenic -y, hunting and gathering, silly person. You know, if I have a friend there doing the workout or a student, I'm doing a workout coaching them. Well, I'm going to be silly and have a, have a time doing it because I've been doing that since I was 10 years old. I think the number I'm up to on daily physical workouts is 14,600 days. So oh, wow. you, you got fun and be silly and get into this kind of meditative state in order for that not to be mundane and boring. So that's, that's kind of how I do it. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that keeps me uh, so motivated is actually enjoy working out. Like I, I really, like I go to the gym for fun. Like most people at the gym, they have a negative mindset about the gym. They think it's torture. Or they don't enjoy it. It's not fun. But I think that's why I can stick to it so easy is because I actually enjoy it. Like I like myself challenging myself to see what I can do and I just it's kind of like a form of meditation almost for me like when I get there put my headphones in I got my music playing and I'm just in there by myself doing my own thing it's kind of like from the rest of the world for me so I actually I enjoy it and I wish if other people would get started and just 
put it in their daily routine where they do it consistently, I think they would kind of start to two over time if they would just kind of get and not just fall off after a week or two weeks or whatever. I'm with you. I, I have to run right now and, and grab a, a, my next appointment, but uh, Murphy, it's wonderful. If people want to reach me, seafoodslim.com. You can take a look at my YouTube channel, which you can find through there, and you can book a session through there. And uh, Murphy, if you want to do another round of this, um, just a an email and, and we'll, we'll book another time and hit another topic. Awesome. It was great to, to meet you, Sifu. I enjoyed our, our talk. Uh, she learned a few things from you, so I'm going to take those. Especially the, the mouthwashing thing was a big one for me. I'm going to have to use that. Don't forget yeah. the Kegel exercise because you're a young guy. You want everything functioning down downstairs. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Do, what's your YouTube name? Just Sifu uh, Slim? The, yeah, the YouTube channel is The Real Show with Sifu Slim. And that okay. uh, that uh, Logan, so I got some interviews with experts and authors. And then I also have things where I'm just giving a, a little map about, uh, you know. So. Awesome. So y'all be sure to check his podcast channel out. Also check my podcast channel out, the Fitness Beginner Podcast. We're on YouTube and we're on all podcasts and platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcast at. But until then, we'll see y'all next week. It was, it was great with you. Um, so yeah, have a great day. Thanks, Murphy. Be well. Thank you.